we went for a crusade. I went for a crusade in Mombasa. If you know Kenya at all, Mombasa is a Muslim settlement. It's a Muslim government. So I was on the pulpit. And I felt the healing power of God come into the service. So I took advantage of it. And I began to pray for the sick. Now there was this guy, nine years old. Um, I don't know. This black stuff here, I don't know the name. It's is is here then this black one is here so instead of it to be here and here it's here what's the medical name for that all right it's exactly that name that that person called <laughs> so that was how the guy was born and i prayed for the sick and his eyes were restored so when we were taking testimonies i noticed it was just a nine-year-old boy what are you why are you here you did not come here alone who did you, the reason why the mom couldn't follow him is because she's, she's a muslim and how can she she contained the situation it's, it's a contradiction so she sent the boy to come and i said no you can't talk here you don't have a voice somebody needs to speak for you you are too small to speak that's how i insisted and then the woman came i said why are you why did you stay back she said well the reason is because she's a muslim so when the, she told us how the child was born and what happened that day, I told him that when this child grows, tell him it was Jesus that healed him. And I did not even ask her to give her life to Christ. I just said, when the child grows, tell him his eyes were like this. And then Jesus made it like this. And I asked her to leave. Because I didn't want to create problems for our pastor. Because when I finish preaching and going, our pastor won't go. He'll be on ground. So I did not lead the woman to Christ publicly. And I didn't even lead her to Christ. I just said, take your miracle. But remember, Jesus, is, she couldn't sleep. That, that my Jesus that I said that healed her child. Oh. The next day, when they were holding midweek service, this woman now appeared there. This time, she gave her life to Christ. <laughs> and once in a month, we normally do 10 hours of prayer. So, the 10 hours of prayer, the woman's husband was the one that dropped her. Because he himself knows that miracle. And I sent a message to them. It was Jesus who died. So the anointing is a resource. Now, 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 she would have, the healing would have taken place because the healing anointing was there. But I wanted it to make profit. There's a purpose for which God gave the anointing. It should produce that result for which Jesus was willing to spend these resources. The anointing is not there to authenticate my ministry and to show people that I'm a prophet, that I can say things and it comes upon. It is supposed to bring profit to the kingdom of God. After a few weeks, persecution broke out on the woman. But we had taught her how to pray for 10 hours. She went on her knees. And you know when people give their life to Christ, initially, God answers prayer. Mm. I am a the hand of God went to fight against the people that rose up against them. So they had to accept that it is the God of heaven that called her to go that way. So that miracle produced profit. The same way God will ask, this grace I give you, this is what it was supposed to produce. This is what you were using it to do. You need to come and give account. Why I did not get my expectation, my return on investment. That's the same way God will ask you for every euro that passed through your hand. How did we get here? Most of you were evangelists that were dispatched to Europe to begin to recover the heritage of God. Only few responded. The rest felt it was for economic purposes that they came. It was so everything they did was self-centered, self-seeking, and you could not see, you could not see that the lands from whence the gospel came to us, God is now sending us back there with the same gospel. Those guys had no reason to be in Africa. They had no reason. They had no reason. Piotin, when did he come? 1950. What are you doing in Nigeria in 1950? And he didn't stay in Lagos. Went to Elisha. It wasn't on the map. They had not drawn the map to accommodate Elisha at that time. A missionary organization came and told him, move to Lagos and we'll support you. He said, God did not send me to Lagos. He accepted. Can you see the kind of conviction this man had? 
we came here. We don't have rules in Nigeria. We came here and then we saw the rules and said, Ah, is there a life like this? And the mission field, they die. That is why I will come when you called me. You had opportunities to be anything you wanted in this number of years you have seen. You decided that you will kindle the lamp. May your days be long. It's very easy. I'm still a professional even now. I saw your, your infrastructure in my field. If I take my certificate there, I will get a job. If I don't get here, I will get in the Netherlands. Yeah, I still know it. So if it's how to make money, ah, I was, we were making it. But Jesus was crying. And I knew he was crying because every time I went to him in prayer, his tears increased. So I said, okay, what can I do to help? He said, leave that job. It was two weeks for me to be a manager in the oil industry. Where you have a big table. You know that table? Very big table. And you speak with baritone. <laughs> he was crying. He was crying. I said, all right. I want to help. I want to do something. To bring a change. At 12 years, I started speaking in tongues. Hmm? How old are you? 20, okay. At 13 years, I went to heaven the first time. For 8 hours. At 14 years, I became a Bible teacher. Became a Bible teacher at 14. Started doing long hours of prayer long, like three days from 18. By the time I was 20, I could see the visions of God. By the time I was 20, I'd exercised my spirit to a point where there was a lot of sin in the university I went to. But the energy in my spirit was stronger than sin. So the only woman I know Canally, it's my wife that I married at the age of 31. Yes. Only me. Meanwhile, 11 years I worked in the oil industry. For 11 years, I worked 16 years. 11 years out of the 16 years, my wife was not with me. So, what I learned on campus, I carried it on in life. In the oil industry in Nigeria, you will see women like the ones they bring out of leather bag. You know when you buy, buy a new... <laughs> May the Lord give you understanding. May the Lord himself. May the Lord himself give you understanding. When they see that you are incorruptible, they will send a woman to you. They will send money. When they send money and they say that you are, you are dead to money, they will send a woman. And they confess with their mouth that there has been no creature that passed this way that was not either weak for women or for money. Where were you born? What's your name? Who is your father? My father. You will be weak. You will compromise if there's no energy in your spirit. You will behave like the people in Belgium. Oh, you don't know you are not of this world. You don't know. So you, you get your identity from Belgium. It means you are using different lenses from the scriptures. Oh, you don't know. In the oil industry, there's a kind of car we drive. Those days, it was, I don't know what it is now, but those days, it was a um, BMW X5. You need to prove to your colleagues that you are man enough to have X5. During the days when X5 was a status car that you bring and say, yeah, you know, I, I, just, I just got this. I got, I, just, I got this phone, I got an iPhone, and the next phone I got is this vehicle. It's some of my toys. Now, you must be able to say that during the days when people were showing X5 as the exhibit of their capacity, those were the days when God said, I should not own a car, and I should use public transport. I thought it would be for six months. It was for seven years. Do you know the yellow buses of Lagos? I, I used it for seven years. When one month salary my salary for one month to buy a car for seven years, it will not allow. 
Every other week, somebody has bought his BMW. The other week, it was only me that was not celebrated in that wise. My celebration was that in those yellow buses I used in Lagos, that's where I got the most iconic revelations that I'm preaching today. Your life is not like this because God chose it. You chose it. And it must be clear. And that is what it is. You might pray for five minutes and you, you, you didn't hear God. Not because God was not speaking. You don't know how to pick his frequency. You may pick, and, and in that state, you cannot survive an emergency. Because in an emergency, you cannot pick the frequencies of God. You didn't train yourself that way. It will not happen all of a sudden. You didn't train yourself that way. It's the way you train yourself that God will lead with you. Hallelujah. I, I can see two people that are offended with my talk. The reason for your offense is Satan. Yeah, that's why you're offended. Satan wants to perpetually keep you in captivity. That's why you're offended. When someone challenges you, in the next five years, you'll still be on the same spot if you don't listen to what I'm telling you. If you don't listen to what I'm telling you. Christianity is dying. Those of you that are older, is this the Christianity that you met when you were younger? What made you comfortable? How come? How did you get here? Oh, they say, uh, Europe is designed to bend you and make you such, such and such a kind of person. Oh, shh. That's when you don't have the Holy Ghost. But meanwhile, I know you're hardworking. But listen to me. When I used to work in the oil industry, you didn't used to work like me. Yes, I can challenge you with that. No. Uh, yes, I can challenge you. Sometimes we start 8 a.m. We end 11 in the night. And then we start 8 a.m. the next day. And there's no Saturday. There's no Sunday. I did that for 16 years. And I still had my fasting life. I still do my 70 days of fasting straight. Yes. I do eight hours of prayer with that thing. Delivered all my reports. I used to man five depots. You know what a depot is? Five. Because my colleagues won't come to work. So I need to help them. So I finish from here. I go finish. I had to develop formulas. You, you don't even know what I'm talking about. You don't know what. I, under those circumstances, I was, still touch, I was still touching base with heaven. If you cannot find God when you, your schedule is tight, if you have time, you will not seek him. Mm. I know most of you are saying, if only I can stop this night shift. <laughs> you stopped it two years ago, but you are more of an unbeliever now than when your schedule was tight. The spirit of the age will hunt you, will make you a slave, will give you a thousand experiences, a thousand reasons for which you should not lay hold on the horns of the earth. It was a risk. I was doing that. I was climbing tanks. You know those tanks? When you climb one of it and you don't climb with food in your stomach, so you should be fasting. So even because if, if you if there's a height you climb to, you will faint if you have eaten. I used to do that fasting. I used to do that praying. I used to move around in tongues. Don't talk to me in the daytime. I will not answer you. Because I'm talking. I'm talking. You, can you answer two calls? You are talking. You are talking. You are talking. You are talking. And the reports are going out. All kinds of data, all kinds of, they are coming out. We bought softwares. We created some to make data processing easy. So that the job will still be going. We we'll spend less time on the job and more time with God. The more that have been in it. So when I did that for 16 years, it was enough training. When Jesus said I should come full time. Now I can lie with on my back from morning till night, praying in tongues. If I do that for three days, mommy, and I greet you, good morning, you will fall. You fall. So I have access to resources. So many of us here, and meanwhile, meanwhile, I'm not even doing well enough based on my scorecard. Huh? So I'm still preparing myself to launch into the deep beyond this point. I still need to take one, one meal off my, my life. Yes, I'm preparing for it. Preparing for it. I will go on a long fast and when I go for 70 days, I will not stop again for my lifetime. Because originally God intended that your spirit will be so big and that your soul will be small. But unfortunately, on the account of the fall, your soul became, you became a living soul. I, I'm coming. Your soul, uh, wait, 
if you know that your life is supposed to be lived on the resources of the spirit you become more diligent in ensuring that the dynamo runs because that's how you get the energy to power your life most of you have appliances in your spirit like television eh? that has, you have not used your spirit television since you gave your life to christ you have not seen one vision You don't even know what an angel looks like. <laughs> and the day God succeeds in smuggling his voice into your, your spirit man, you will not say something, say it, something, something told me, something spoke. No, I took effort. It took effort. Angels had to disarm you. Sometimes they will need to allow you to fall sick terribly and drip on your hand so that your soul will be quiet. Then they say, Sandra. When you wake up, you say something. Was because you don't know the way of exercising your spirit. You don't know the way of exercising your spirit. So you don't know the language of the spirit. You don't know the move of the spirit. Because the Bible says, holy men of old, they speak as they were moved. They were. You don't know that experience. You don't know it. You don't know it. So your vocal cord has never been lent unto the Lord for him to speak. Your television has never worked. Because there's no power to power it. Your heater has never worked. There's a dimension of fire that produce, produces light and heat at the same time. Your heater has not, not worked since you gave your light to Christ. You're running from pillar to post. And they're always giving testimony about your job. That they just added 3 euro. Added 4 euro. That's your testimony. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Added six euro to train allowance. I say. Use trains. You will never know what you are capable of until you exercise your spirit. The greatest, the most terrible God itself, it blocks you from God at all. So you are seeing yourself, you can't see God. God will need to defeat self before you can actually serve the will of God. And if someone that has not been dealt with is anointed, he will use the anointed to serve himself. Jehovah Elohim comes into the garden. Then he begins to model. Begins to mold. He molded an encasement. The same encasement that we have, it was him that molded it. And he was molding it without supervision. So he's the one that decided to have one head and two heads. If he wanted us to have two heads, he had, he could have done that. This is how he decided that would be. And then the Bible says that this Jehovah Elohim breathed into the nostrils of man. And the effect of his breath was that man became a living soul. Now, before I end today, because this is the introduction of my sermon. And the, the title of my sermon is What Air Do You Breathe? Now, it's a long journey. That This statement I've made, we need to do a lot of research in the Bible to analyze your life, analyze my life. We came for analysis. We didn't come for a, for a message to, so that you will know where you are just in case you were expecting that that one night that you woke up and prayed and you were expecting thunder to strike and it didn't happen. I will tell you why. It's because of the air that you breathe. Your possibilities are within the range of the air. So the first blast of his nostrils that came to man made him a living soul. What's the meaning of that? Living soul. Because your soul is the seat of your intelligence. Your soul is the seat of your emotion. Your soul is the seat of your will. Are you there? So that's where human life is in your soul. Human life is in your soul. Because it's through human life that you, you can relate with your environment. Relate. You can learn chemistry. You can learn physics. And a lot of people have used the resources of this breath of life. Like in China. I see your skyscrapers here. And the way your roads are paved. And there's so much planning that you can discern in the society that we have in Europe. So much planning. It's even better in China. And all those guys that did all those things are not born again. They just have their living soul. 
So there's a dimension of dominion that you can accomplish because of learning. You, you feed the soil of your soul. And it makes, gives you dimensions of competence. Most of the time, when we want to talk about Christians, we use the parameters of the living soul to judge Christian life. There's a huge confusion in the body of Christ as to who a Christian really is. Are you there? So somebody comes to give a testimony and the testimony is given is how he succeeded in, in a business deal and he hit a contract and he was able to get 12 million euros. His status has changed, his level has changed. We have a problem with that. The reason why we have a problem with that is because there are unbelievers that have bigger contracts. You say, okay, you bought a car. What of the... Or you, you got business class seat. What's of the person that owns the airplane? The guy that owns Boeing, where, what church does he attend? <laughs> we, we have a problem. Because what you are giving as a testimony, you don't need God to achieve that. You don't need God to achieve that. So we have made the gospel, the gospel of things that I, eyes can see of material and of money. That's what the gospel is. That's the goal. Of our faith, why is it faith so that you have more money? Is it faith so that you have more cars? And then say, I have two master's degrees, two five cars packed. That's the tragedy of a wasted life. The parameters with which we use to measure life. When your life on earth is accomplished, you'll be ashamed of yourself. And I'm not saying don't have cars. It makes life easy. I have three. I have one for me, one for my wife. And the other one that they used to run the house. So I have cars. So I'm not, but I, I, I never came to the pulpit to say, I ride Range Rover. No. In my own opinion, that doesn't make for the pulpit's testimony. Whether it was given to you, somebody felt you needed to have it and he gave it to you and you feel excited about it and indeed it's a work of God, it's God that facilitated it, it doesn't make for a pulpit testimony. Doesn't make for a pulpit testimony. What is it that your life was designed designed to to wrath upon the face of the earth? Are the giants that you were called to to kill are they still standing? So the giants I'm called to conquer are still standing, and I'm giving testimony of Range Rover. The Range Rover was brought into my life so that I can be effective in my ministry and get quick get to the place where the giants are quickly. It was meant to facilitate my journey. It it doesn't. Are you, are you with me? Those are the resources that were made available so that I can prosecute my mission. And I'm coming to testify about the Range Rover as though it was my mission. People that testify about Range Rovers and vehicles and little business breakthroughs and all of that are operating from the realm of the breath of life. Breath of life. And I don't want to go far on this so that you will not hate me. I want to be loved too. So <laughs> I don't want to go far on this. Transform your life by downloading sermons from KingdomEchoes.com with just one click of a button.